Hey, welcome back. Uh, any questions before we start? If you any questions, any if you'd like to share your thoughts, uh, what we're sharing. I hope uh, uh, we're all understanding and learning. Any questions, any thoughts you'd like to share as well? Feel free. Any challenges that you know people have shared with you, and uh, you, know, you feel that you, know, you need to grow more in that area? You can always feel free to ask questions. You all are learning together. Right. Okay, so there's no questions. We'll get into our notes. Let me just present the notes. Okay, so we stopped here. Uh, Give no room to the enemy. Uh, just shut every door that you feel, uh, you know, that the enemy is trying to gain entrance. Close that door. And, uh, just pray God's word. Pray for uh, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live that holy life. Right. Next point is receive healing for offenses, hurts, and wounds. Now, in life, each one of us, whether we are leaders, whether we are cell group leaders, pastors, associate pastors, senior pastor, pioneering a ministry, whatever it is, we will have opportunities where we will be hurt by others, offended by those who are near us, and those wounds are very hard because, uh, you know, many times if you you know, you confide in somebody and feel they're like your brother or your sister, and, uh, and they turn their back against you, or they, uh, you know, say wrong things, uh, or ridicule or hurt you. It's very difficult to receive healing for those offenses. Right? Uh, Luke 17, 1 says, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. To be effective ministers of God, we cannot carry offenses, hurts, and wounds in our inner being. We cannot carry that baggage everywhere we go, right? Because this will hinder the work that God wants to release through us, right? And are there people who hurt me? In, in, in these many years of ministry. Yes, there are, right? There have been some who have said things that have not been true and things that have, you know, may have, uh, I, I wish I could clarify, but, but one of the things that I personally learned is to forgive and to let go. Because many times when we hold on to these things, I realized that I'm holding on to the past so much that it's not allowing me to move forward. These offenses, these hurts are so much. It could be something very simple. Right? Many years back, you know, I remember I was leading worship and this uh, uh, very uh, well-meaning individual, uh, this man came up to me and said, you know, you need to change the way you lead worship songs are the songs that you choose also are i think you should really spend time in god's presence and uh, choose the right songs and i was deeply i took it very offense i was very offended by what he said why because i just spent many hours uh, you know hours in god's presence like you know asking god to minister to me minister to people and many times people have said, oh, Paul, you're, you know, I was blessed by the worship. It feels nice. But now all of a sudden this man came up to me and said, you know, you need to change the way you lead worship. I said, then I remember, you know, justifying that and saying, you don't know what you're talking about because so many people said the worship is good. So many people like my you know, worship. Maybe you should change the way you look at things. And my mind was, I was so upset. The reason I thought that way was because that offense, I'm talking out of that offense, out of being hurt. And I held on to that. And for many, many, well, I would say weeks, many times that I 
led worship, those thoughts would come up. Am I, am I not an effective worship leader? Should I be leading worship when people think like this? I know, you know, uh, you know, maybe my songs, the song selection was not right. And this is happening during the worship. What happens? I, I have not received healing for these offenses. And I am trying to minister to people and you know, bring them uh, into the presence of God. But there's a hindrance. Because I have something in my heart. So if there is a hindrance, then God will, you know, it, it stops the release of what God wants to do through us. Right. So whatever that hindrance, it could be something very simple, right? It not be a big offense, something very simple, right? Uh, or, or, or it could be a big thing as well, a big hurt, a big wound that is just not being, not yet healed. As to be effective ministers, we cannot carry that offense. We need to let go of it. Acts 24, 16 says, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. Void, the word void means empty. A conscience that has an empty or a void offense towards God and towards men. Why towards God? Sometimes you can have an offended God. Why? God, I'm so much better than this other person, but you're using him more than using me. You're giving him or her all the opportunities more than me. What happens? Our offenses with God this time. Right? And I love what that parable, how Jesus spoke in that beautiful parable. He said, he, he called three workers. I forget the chapter and verse, but he called these three workers. And he said, go and work. Uh, and he chose three of them at different hours of the day. And he gave all three of them the same amount of money. And the other two said, hey, we've been working more hours. But Jesus, the landowner says, but you agreed to this amount. Do I not have the right to give what I wish to the people who work in my field? I've agreed to this. It's powerful. You know, sometimes we say, we get offended with God. So God, how can you use him? You know, I'm sure I spend more time in God's presence. I've got a, uh, you know, more of the anointing. He can't even prophesy, but I can. Or he cannot, uh, you know, speak in tongues. But you no, know, uh, this other person can. And we get our offense against God. And Paul is saying, God, I'm empty of offense with you and with men. Hebrews twelve fourteen and fifteen says, "Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God." lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defined and strong verses sorry then as well matthew 5 23 and 24 therefore if you bring any gift to the altar and there remembers that a brother had or against thee leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first be reconciled to the brother then come and offer the gift. With that, God will be pleased with that offering. Mark 11, 25, 26. And when we stand praying, forgive if ye have ought any against, that your Father which also in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So what is the main uh, essence of all these verses? Avoid offense. Avoid living with it. Right? Forgive one another. Uh, Matthew 5, we just read 23. If you have something against your brother and you're coming to the altar, leave that offering there. Go be reconciled. Whether it is his fault or your fault, go be reconciled. And then come and offer your offering, which will be pleasing at God's eyes. We must learn to forgive and forget release people this could be within the family this could be within the church family this could be between brothers and sisters in christ um, between mentors and disciples whatever we need to 
learn to forgive. It is a choice that we make. To hate someone is to give them too much importance. We renounce all feeling of hate and ill will and resentment. Proverbs 18.14 says, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Who can bear a wounded spirit? It's very hard. It's very hard to, you know, sometimes uh, a physical hurt is something that can be, we can bear. Right? But a hurt in the a wound in the spirit or the soul is no medicine apart from God. Right? You get a physical hurt, you have all kinds of medicines, you go to the doctor, they have different options. You get it right? You have your fracture or you dislocate your hands or legs. But it's temporary. Right? You can you know, go to the doctor, yes, of course, you may not be able to function as normally as before, but you'll be back on your feet. But a wounded soul, nobody can see it. Right? It can be inside, and if the wound is not dealt with, it becomes like cancer. It can just spread and spread and spread and destroy a person's life. Right? So if there are things in our lives, just let go of it. Let go of it. If you haven't forgiven, there are things we haven't, people we haven't forgiven for years. Maybe the Holy Spirit will remind us. You say, God, I want to release forgiveness. Why? Because that's what you called me to do. And as a leader, as a minister of God, I want the work of the Holy Spirit to be released more through me. And if this is a hindrance, I'm willing to let go of it and to humble myself and bring forgiveness to the people who have hurt me. Right? Know and maintain your priorities. Right? Know your priorities. Your ministry, your cell group leading, your uh, you know your uh, all the planning and preparation um, with the volunteer teams and everything is very very important. But maintain your priorities in life. First one, your personal walk with God. Maintain it. Without this personal walk with God, you know we can, we can work, we can do everything, but we'll be relying on our own strength. But we need to rely on the strength of God. Mm -hmm. Two, family. If you're a youth, family. Right? Your parents are important. Yeah, if yes. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, they are important. Spend time with them. Family is important because, uh, you know, as leaders, and we've talked about this before as well, as leaders, many times we get so engaged in the things of ministry that we forget about our wife and uh, about our family. You know, hey, I'm doing God's work. Yeah, we're doing God's work, but God has entrusted your wife or your husband and the children into your hands. It is our responsibility. Then we look at a job and our work that God has given us, right? Then it's ministry. Now, when you look at these four, look at the list. Right? First is personal work with God. Second is family. Then is the work or whatever we're doing. And if you're in full-time ministry, then that's your work. Then is ministry. So ministry comes forth. Interesting, right? Sometimes you think ministry is first. Ministry is an outflow of our personal walk with God. What ministry can we do if there is no personal walk with God? There's not going to be, not going to be any fruit. Right? And fruit is important. Otherwise, we keep doing things and you see no fruit. Uh, then there's, there's no walk with God. Right? So maintain, know and maintain your priorities. And as you do this at a young age or maybe even as you're leading a uh, cell group or ministering in church, make sure that these priorities are met. Right? Uh, don't ignore your family just because you, you know, you want to raise or you want to be known in the ministry or you're doing God's work. Don't ignore 
family. Yes, you're doing God's work, but God is entrusted in the family to you. So we must look after, we must spend time, oh, go on vacations, go on, right? There'll be times, right? Uh, uh, that seasons that we have, and just, just go along with it. No, maintain your priorities. Right? It's something to consider while you uh, follow these, while we follow these four uh, priorities. Uh, activity does not equal accomplishment. We can keep doing something, and that something can be keep. We can keep doing it for days, and weeks, and months, and eventually it may go on for a year or so. But it does not mean you've accomplished something. Work smart, not harder. Right? Uh, it's just a saying. Yes, we work smart and harder. Right? Organize or agonize. Evaluate. Or stagnate. Schedule your priorities. Right? Uh, again, priorities is coming here. Reacting is not leading. Say no to little things. Right? Uh, and how, how to say no gracefully? Uh, if a person gives an idea, you know what, in the church we must come, we must do this. Right? Now you know it's something that you don't want to do in the church or you don't want to do in the cell group. Right? Uh, say, for example, somebody in your cell group says, you know what, in the cell group, we must pray in tongues for one, one hour fully, entire one hour. Is it, a, uh, is it sinful? No. But you as a leader know that, OK, this is something that uh, the cell group is for fellowship. We need to talk to each other, hear from each other, build each other up. So how do I say no? You're not saying no to the person, but you're saying no to the idea, right? And say no gracefully, right? There's a way of saying no. Right? Uh, many times, you know, uh, and also it can come up when you're having discussions in a cell group. Somebody's going on talking and going off topic. Then gracefully say no, right? Uh, say, hey, uh, you know, uh, if you don't mind, can we? Uh, go back to our discussion because this is we're going uh, off our main topic. Or there'll be times when uh, you know uh, uh, we have to say no and we put our foot down, right? As leaders, so there's nothing wrong with it, right? Uh, because sometimes we say no and then we look at the reaction of the person and maybe they don't come back to the cell group and say, "Okay, you come, we'll try it." If you know it's not helping the cell group, it's, it's, it's all right. right? Uh, uh, come up with alternatives. Right? Uh, respond in terms that is in best interest for the person asking. Right? So as leaders, each one of us, right? it's OK to say no. Yeah, because you're not saying no to the person, you're saying no to the idea. Right. It's okay to say, hey, I'm unavailable as of now. You know, we don't take on the position of God. It's it's not like if I say I'm unavailable, oh God will get so upset with us. No. It's all right. right? If you're if you're on a holiday or you're on leave with your family in a, at a vacation, maybe uh, just in a different city. Somebody from church calls you. If it's something important, you handle it. You try to handle it. But if it's not important, you say, hey, can I just call you back once I'm back in town? We can discuss more of this once I'm back. Nothing wrong. Now, they may take it in a different way. They may say, hey, he's not, uh, you know, he's not uh, talking. I mean, he's not uh, discussing this important issue that we have right now. It may be important, but right now, what is important for, for your family is not for you to be on the phone. Uh, the whole time you're in, on vacation because family is also important, right? It's just priority, right? Right. Next point: be an example. First Timothy chapter four and verse twelve. Right now, this is the most difficult part. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith. And impurity. The greatest example that we can preach is the life that we live. 
right? All of us can, you know, stand by that, right? This is the greatest example, the life we live. Uh, we can speak or preach a thousand messages, but our life speaks stronger than that. A genuine leader is consistent with what he says and what he does. Right? That's a sign of a genuine leader. If he says he's doing it, he should be able to do it. Now, if he's not been not doing it for so, some reason, he must inform his team, uh, whoever he's working with, the reasons as to why he's not able to do it, and probably get more time and uh, ask for you know more time or whatever the reasons could be. Right? But a genuine leader is consistent with what he says and what he does. Your character is a foundation on which your ministry stands. Right? Uh, always remember, we reproduce our own kind. Right? Uh, we're brave, bold, godly, passionate, strong leaders will raise up the same kind of leaders. Leaders who are insecure, uh, always late, always uh, procrastinating. Uh, leaders who are always grumbling about things uh, or uh, they don't want to take risky uh, calls or uh, leaders who are lazy would raise up leaders that produce the same kind of leaders. So be an example. Be an example. If, if you are a cell group leader, start now. You don't have to wait till you become a pastor. Uh, you don't have to wait till you're leading 100, 200, 500 people. God gives you the opportunity, wonderful, but start off with the small so that when you get the big, you know your priorities are set. Right? So the greatest message you can ever preach is the life you live. Right? Any questions? Any thoughts? Seems very quiet today. Any questions? Now, everyone are able to track along. Uh, please let me know if I'm going too fast in any way. Should we continue? Thumbs up. OK. All right, so let's continue. OK, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. OK, let's continue. Let's look at the heart of a leader. Right, the heart of a leader. Every one of us uh, are called to some kind of leadership, right? Uh, and uh, we can just be a volunteer team leader in the church. These are certain priorities and certain responsibilities that we must have, right? Being a leader in God's kingdom is not an easy thing. Leadership brings great responsibilities. It's very true, right? I'm sure all of us have tasted leadership and tasted that it comes with responsibilities, right? Let's read this verse. Uh, first point, leadership involves a new life of servanthood. Avoid both the inferiority complex and the superiority complex uh, because both are not good for a leader. Now, I remember when I joined you know, in the ministry, uh, 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 very clearly I remember, right? Because I always thought I was not qualified enough or, uh, uh, you know, I always thought I was a very shy boy. So uh, will I be able to do this? And there are people who are so much better than me. And that inferiority complex, which I had from, from the time I was a little boy, uh, it was not something new to me, right? In everything, I had an inferiority complex. Uh, but even when I joined ministry, I knew I was a believer. I knew that God is working in my life. But that, because I had that inferiority complex from the time I was small, I began to work with these, you know, wonderful men and women of God, and they were so learned. And I always thought, oh man, am I am I good enough? Am I, you know, uh, so for, for quite a few months initially, I was, you know, as you say, you know, whatever, you know, shall, we shall do it this way or whatever you say we'll do. 
uh, I, I didn't take on the responsibility of being a leader. I was a leader, you know, leading the cell groups, but I didn't take on the responsibility. I always thought, okay, they're all much better than me. They can lead it better themselves. Uh, so that inferiority complex. Now, I thank God for granting us, granting me the grace to help me to shed off that inferiority complex. Let's read John 13, verse 3 to 17. Yes, can any one of us read it? It's here on your, I can just zoom it a little bit. I hope you can see it. Yeah. Can any one of us read it? Uh, John 13, 3 to 17. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and, and that he was from God and went to God, he, he raised it from supper and laid aside his garment and took the towel and girded himself. After that, he, uh, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Simon said unto him, Lord, doest thou wash my feet? Um, Jesus answered and said to him, um, What do I, what do, sorry, what I do thou uh, knowest not now, but thou shalt know it hereafter. Peter uh, said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered and uh, answered him, "If if I wash, thy not, thou hast no part with me." Simon P Peter, Simon Peter said unto him, "Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head." Jesus said to him, uh, "He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but but is clean." Every with and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore said he, ye, uh, ye are not all clean. Soon after he washed their feet and had taken his garment and, uh, and was set down again. And he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? He, uh, ye Call me master and lord, and ye uh, say well, for I, for so I am. For if I then, you lord and master, have not washed your feet, ye also ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye, ye should do what, as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is no greater than his lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. All right. Thank you. Uh, right. So this whole example here, the Lord Jesus is talking about how he washed the disciples' feet. And he's telling them, he set the example and he says, now you people call me master and Lord. Now, being master and Lord, I have washed your feet, right? Now, you also go and wash others' feet. Again, what is the principle, right? The principle is be humble, be willing to serve, have a servant attitude. No matter how big, how strong, how, how great you become as a leader, be servant-like. Right? Three temptations here to avoid, to be self-sufficient. Oh. You know, especially when we are, you know, very good in our work, it's very easy to be self-sufficient, okay? So, for example, you know, uh, we've been leading worship for many years, and I've used this example before, right? Many years we've led worship, many, many places. So, one hour of worship, no problem. I just choose four or five songs. We can do it. It's not a big deal, right? We've done it before. We can do it anytime. But the temptation is to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. Okay, I've done it before, I can do it now. Yes, we thank God for the grace, for the gift and the talents. But I need to depend on the Holy Spirit. I need to depend on God. I cannot be 
self-sufficient. I cannot say, okay, this is something that I can do on my own. No. In every area, be self-sufficient. It would be even preparing a sermon, uh, preparing for your life group, preparing for cell groups, raising up leaders. So now you see, it's it's something that it's it's my forte. It's the word that they use. It's something that God has gifted me in, and I can just do it. But remember, don't be self-sufficient. Rely on the on the Holy Spirit. Two, temptation to avoid is to be spectacular. Right? Uh, oh, I can do this. You know, just making up things sometimes. You know, just a spectacular. You know, sometimes just giving out a word which is not even you know relevant, or you know, just making this whole feeling that you're spectacular. Celebrity mentality. When you come, somebody should. Of course, none of us are like that. Uh, but it is sadly happening around us, and I'm sure all of us can, uh, you know, give us examples. But there is so much that's happening. This whole celebrity mentality. So it's it's not from God. God says, "Be servant like." Now, doesn't mean that we don't enjoy the things of this world. You want to buy? We need to buy a house. Buy the house. You buy a car. You need the car, right? But we are not being spectacular, big celebrities. Buy things. Thank God for the blessings that He has blessed us with, right? And third one, a temptation to avoid is to be powerful, to be in charge. That is why we focused earlier on on teams, right? The moment you build teams, you know that it's a teamwork. So, for example, there's a church with hundred people, and you are the leader of the church, right? Now, it's not like it's the, you're in charge of the church. Yes, you may be making the decisions, but without those volunteer teams, without this sound and setup team, the well, media team, the uh, you know the oh, ushering team, the greeters team, you can't do all of it. You can't be doing uh, as a you know the the pastor may not even know anything about uh, speakers and how they set up the mixer, everything. No, just just that feeling of being powerful uh, or being in charge of everything should go. We must come to a place of saying, you know, hey, take on this team. Do this, do that, right? And encourage others, even as they do that, right? Servant, Christ like servant leaders are motivated to, by love to serve others. They possess a security that allows them to minister to others, right? Uh, now, security is the prerequisite to great undertaking. Now, uh, that's why we. Uh, you know, always emphasize, right? Who we are in Christ is who we really are. Uh, and we were talking about this in the mentoring hour uh, last week, where, uh, you know, what about all of these titles that people have, you know, Reverend, Reverend Doctor, Pastor, Apostle, Prophet, and all of these titles, uh, are they important? Uh, and one of the students asked us, uh, and, and the point is, if we are putting our, if, you know, our everything that we are on that title, if we are walking based out of that title, then one day when that title goes, we will fall. But if we are walking out of our knowing who we are in Christ, our standing as sons and daughters of Christ, whether there is a title or there's no title, it won't matter. Right? Uh, you'll be willing to do anything and everything that God has for you. Right? It could be a smallest task. You'll be willing to do it. Don't say, oh, I'm the pastor, so I will not set the chairs. It's your church. You have to do it. Or I'm the cell group leader and leading all these cell group pastors, leading all these cell groups. So I will not call up this. Calling up is something very menial. They should call me up. No. Right? Only insecure insecurity will cause us to, you know, to fail. So be be willing, right? 
initiate servant ministry to others, receive servant ministry from others, teach people about servanthood. People do what you see. And there are plenty of examples, right? People do what we see. Uh, second aspect to look at is keep a constant examination on your heart attitudes. And we talked about heart attitudes, right? Uh, leadership begins with an attitude. Why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, my attitude, here are a few biblical principles about attitude. Uh, second, yeah. My attitude is as I begin a task will affect its outcome more than anything else. So imagine I'm, I'm given a task. If my attitude towards this is, oh man, this is not going to be something that's going to be easy. Oh, I wish I didn't have to do this now or all the times, right? Uh, so, for example, the pastor comes and says, okay, you be in charge of, uh, you know, we're going to have a youth concert, Christmas or Easter is coming up. We're going to have an Easter program, Easter concert. So you be in charge. Uh, two ways to look at it. First one, oh, thank you, God, for the opportunity. Thank you, pastor, for the opportunity. I'll do my best. Uh, well, can you help me? What should I do? I should form teams, do this, do this, do this. Or the second option is, Oh, Easter. Easter is too close. Now it's too late. Uh, how will we form the team? How will we do this? Um, uh, can we do it next year? Uh, can we skip it this year? Or uh, who will come for the Christmas, uh, for the Easter program? Already this whole uh, anti-conversion bill is started. Uh, and we can look at things so negatively, it will affect the outcome of our work. So our attitude matters. My attitude towards others determine the attitude determines their attitudes towards me. If I think this person is able to do something and you spur them on and you encourage them to do it, they will be able to do it. They will give their hundred percent. Right? Whether they achieve it or not, they will give their hundred percent. But if on the flip side, if we have an attitude, oh, this guy can't do it. Uh, well, this person cannot do this. It's, it's too much of a task for him. Then uh, that attitude will rub off. And maybe if they notice it and they see it, they, that's what's going to happen. My attitude is a major difference between success and failure. My attitude can turn problems into blessings. My attitude can give me an uncommon perspective of on life. Right. My attitude is either my best friend or my worst enemy. My attitude and not my achievement will give me success or happiness. So important, right? My attitude and not my achievement, right? Achievements are good. It's wonderful, right? Uh, but the right attitude to, you know, to uh, reach those achievements, that is what gives will give us more success, more happiness, right? My attitude will change when I choose to change it. Right? I may think of a certain thing or a certain ministry or certain people in a, in, in a particular way. But my attitude will change only when I change to choose it. If I look at people and think, okay, this person cannot do something or is not capable enough. And I keep thinking that. I. Uh, you know, I, I I may lose out on a good leader in the future. I need to make the choice and say, okay, God, you know, I need to change my attitude about this person. He may have, you know, failed the first time, but doesn't mean he'll fail again. Maybe he can do better. Maybe he can, uh, you know, just build this ministry much better than what I've been doing. Right? Uh, it's a change that we must make. My attitude needs continual adjustment. And remember, our attitude is contagious. How we feel, how we express our thoughts, our words, our emotions is contagious. Let's picture this. You know, you get into office on Monday morning and you're so you know you're not talking to anyone, you're just throwing the things around in your table, you know, you have your bottle, you just you know, bang the bottle on the table and you just you know, grumpily sit on the chair and you complain about the chair that's making noise. And uh, you sit there and said, Oh man, man, you're not saying anything, but people are watching it. Now, what happens? You also feel, Oh man, Sunday, Monday morning is gone. Another week of work. It's contagious. 
we need to change our attitude, right? Uh, so have biblical principles, yeah, even as you, uh, you know, continue in ministry, check on your heart. Always ask the question, Lord, is this right in your presence? Is this right what I'm doing? You know that uh, last Sunday we were talking about this WWJD. What would Jesus do? What I'm doing, is it pleasing in your eyes? Is it right? Does your word say, is it right? Am I obedient to God's word? Am I obedient to the Holy Spirit? Am I doing what is pleasing in your eyes? Is this something that would please you? Stop. Ask questions. Check your heart motive. Check your attitude. And then carry on. Right? And even as you do this, be a dreamer. Right? Uh, God does not give dreams and visions to entertain us. A God-given uh, dream begins a God-given task that we must accomplish. Uh, and a God-given vision births a God-given purpose that we must pursue. Right? So if God's put a vision in your heart, go ahead, you know, just uh, dream, dream big, dream bigger things for God. If you have a church which is maybe uh, 100 people, dream big things. Say, God, in two years, I want to see, you know, 200 people in the church. Nothing wrong with that. I want to see the uh, ministry teams growing. I want to see volunteer teams growing. I see hundreds of people sitting here and being ministered to. But there's a part that we must do, right? There's a task that we must accomplish. There's a purpose that we have to pursue it because it's a vision, right? God-given dreams and visions are usually several times greater than ourselves because God does not look at our capabilities to accomplish them. But what he's doing is he's just looking for yielded vessels. He's just looking for people who are available. Are you available? If you're available, I'll use you. But God, I don't have the skills. I didn't ask you about that. I will anoint you. Look at Peter. I'm sure Peter would have thought that, right? Fishing in the Sea of Galilee. Right? God says, the Lord Jesus chooses him. That time only he says, why are you choosing me? I'm just a fisherman. Then he, he's with Jesus. All of a sudden, he feels he's the greatest. Then he denies Jesus. He goes back to fishing. And then Jesus says to him, hey, Peter, take care of my church. You know, you know look at that. Uh, uh, yeah, Peter says, are you sure, Lord? And then he agrees to it. Peter was not. You know, we know from if you see later on in the book of Acts, you say, "Isn't this man unschooled? Right? Where did he get all this learning from? He's a fisherman. He's not talking about the waves and the seas and the different kinds of fish. He's talking about the book of Joel and all these uh, prophecies, all these prophets of the Old Testament, and he's comparing that and he's talking with so much of wisdom and authority. Which school did he go to? No, unschooled fisherman." God used them so powerfully. And if you look at history, there are so many of them. Right? Uh, not, not really you know, great in terms of uh, anything, any capabilities, but they were willing to do something. Look at the missionaries who went into Africa, went into India, came into India. May not have been great minds with great intellects, but just yielded vessels and God used them. Look at William Carey. He started all these universities, came to India. You know, the, in those years, they didn't have transportation. They didn't have trains and, you know, they, where they could just travel to one place to another, call each other up, hey, how is the work there? Nothing was there. Towns and villages of India came here, you know, left the luxuries of the other, you know, of, um, of the well-developed countries came into India with a vision, started these uh, Bible college centers and just did such an amazing work. Ephesians 3.20, powerful, powerful verse. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more above all that we can ask, think, or imagine, according to his power that's working with us. So be a dreamer. 
think big, have a big vision, and work towards it. Right? Uh, be totally committed. Be fully in. Right? Be positive. God has never failed. An optimistic attitude energizes and transformed us. Look at this. Uh, this is a wonderful passage here, and you know, in First Samuel thirty-three and eight. Uh, let me just keep, take you know, just quickly say what happened. You know, uh, David was camping in a certain place with all his family and the armies of Israel. Uh, the enemies came. They took David's wife, his children, everyone, destroyed the place. And and David, when he came, he and he saw that he was greatly distressed. Verse six says here. Uh, First Samuel thirty six says, and David was greatly distressed for the for the people spoke of stoning him because the others lost their lives, lost the sorry not lost the uh, their family right, their sons and daughters. Everyone were trying to kill David. David, you told us to camp here. The enemies have come, taken everything. They burnt all our uh, this entire place. They've taken our family and our children. We're going to kill you now. But what did David do? Run away? No. But he encouraged himself. Right? He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David did something after. He didn't just encourage himself and uh, you know uh, sit there in that place waiting for God. No. He maintained a positive attitude. He said, okay, we're going to get back what we have lost. So he says, verse 7 and 8. And David said to uh Abithia, the priest, Abimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the effort. And uh, Abiathar brought the effort to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after the troops? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So to end the story, David inquires of the Lord. God says, Go. You know, he's... Uh, he was distressed, but now his attitude is completely changed. Inquires of the Lord. God says, "Go, you will re you will recover all of them." So he goes. Uh, end of the story is he brings all of them back, and not even one person had lost their lives. He recovered everyone from the from the Israelite camp. Everyone came back. Right? You and I overcome evil with good. We overcome fear with faith. We overcome adversity with tenacity we overcome negativism by being positive right look at what david did it's a wonderful example for us uh, always maintain a strong positive uh, spirit declare what god is saying god has always said he will cause us to triumph there will be seasons of ups and downs failures we will fall down we will be weak we will be weary but he will lift us up he will cause us to try now if we allow things that were designed to harm us uh, you know uh, god can perfect that right uh, satan will remain defeated before us he's able to take things what the enemy meant for evil he's able to take it and turn it for good right so this one this is a wonderful encouragement for us as leaders even as we are leading teams, leading churches, leading ministries, our hard attitude counts, our personal life, our character, all of this really speaks, right? Uh, so let's stop here uh, and uh, we'll just close in prayer. Uh, any thoughts, any questions? No, we can close. All right. All right, let's, let's close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you. Uh, for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for teaching us, Lord. And even as we continue to lead ministries that we've been assigned and uh, leading our family, leading our, in the workplace, wherever we are, God, help us to walk with servant-like attitudes. Help us to we walk with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God. Thank you for all that you've done for each one of us. Bless each and every student. Pray, God, that you will empower, strengthen, and lead and be with each one of them, oh God. Even as they learn that the words, the word of God be a seed in good ground, to bear fruit in each of their lives, oh God. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week ahead. I'll see you next week. God bless. Bye now.